For all things Pelicans, you're now tuned into the Pelican Post Game Report. Much love to the fam. Appreciate y'all for joining us for this episode of the Pelican Post Game Report. We up in this thing. Shout out to the fam, man, for uh, all of the support over the past week or so as we get ready to get ready for the full off season of the Pelicans. Right now, the NBA playoffs are about to go into NBA finals mode momentarily. And that's good for some of the bases that are actually participating from a team perspective. But for those unfortunate people who we happen to be one of, hey, we are going to do this type of thing. So anyway, shout out to the fan. Please feel free to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button and put us out there on your social media feed. It helps us out. I'm Big Q. We got DC chiming in with me on this episode. DC. Yeah. What's popping, brother? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Uh, the the pals is popping. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. We we in the off season. You ain't lying. We get to, yeah, we get to look forward to 2024. You know, and and get out of that dreadful end to 2023. So, uh, this is the part where we could start to get a little excited, get a little creative, uh, use our imaginations because you know our front office needs that from us, and. We could kind of lay out the format, man, for uh, moves we should make, things we should do, and ideas that we have going forward to propel the Pelicans into the level of maybe where the Denver Nuggets are right now, right? Well, one can only hope, DC, that we can get up there. Like we talked about pre uh, prior to the show, how the Denver, we called them the Denver McNuggets, that they are actually shining pretty good right now, sweeping the Lakers I'm on up out of here and then and they're in the finals, man. Headed up against more than likely probably be Miami or uh, you know, I think Miami might be the team, even though Boston's trying to make it a series. But in the end, they represent the West. Ran away with in, in the Western Conference finals, man. To pushing A D and LeBron clean up out of here. NBA experiment try to, to set the Lakers in there. It failed. So shout out to Denver. They still got the Celtics. Uh, uh, uh. Man, these scripts, man. They need to shoot whoever doing this. Anyway, so we're going to move forward in this episode of the Pelican Post. Garen Report. much love to the fam. Let's get into, we covered this earlier. This is the NBA preview uh, that we talked about, and we're going to get uh, intricately in it. We're going to talk about some of the other things as the Pelicans offseason program, D.C., 144 million in guaranteed money committed to just eight players. Pelicans won't have the cap room in the offseason, however, but they will uh, look to kind of lock up the lowest cost team options and nine guaranteed salaries from like people like Herb and Jose, Najee, perhaps. You know, and with that, they should remain below, you know, that vaunted luxury tax line. So we do have a lot of people, man, to be honest with you, a lot of really good young players that we really need to get going and add to them and make sure they're more functional entities inside of the team. We do have some questions surrounding the team. So let's delve into a DC. I've covered this. You've seen the show. You've, mm-hmm. you've covered this article. Let's get your two cents on that, bro. Well, um, a lot of people want the man in the picture out of here, but... I don't until we can find a viable replacement. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, that would be the easiest fix, and then we could keep everybody else. Also, you have the idea of um, maybe not bringing back Najee and Jackson Hayes. I don't think it's any way her, you know, Jose, Dice, or Trey goes anywhere. You know what I'm saying? And um. They got to get below that tax line. There's no way the Pels are going to pay the luxury tax. We haven't won anything. I think Miss Benson is probably willing to pay the luxury tax if we were truly a winning team. Let's say if the Pels made it to the second round and we got bounced out, then we potentially probably would bring everybody back. But there's definitely has to be some form of roster shakeup. It's pretty much impossible for us to bring everybody back as it were last season. Um as I stated previously, Jonas Valanciunas would be the easiest option um, with 15 million coming off the uh, off the books if you do that. But who do you replace him with? It's easier said than done. Um, there's a lot of 
I guess, ideas people have had for years of wanting to get Miles Turner. Well, guess what? Miles Turner makes, uh, I believe, 20 or 25 million a year. And you got Jonas at 15. So potentially he plays out his contract. Najee is a guy who is what making, what, three or four million dollars? Q? You remember what his contract is? But yeah, yeah it's, uh, I'm going to pull it up momentarily, DC. Yeah. But Najee uh, definitely commands a bigger contract, in my opinion. I think he's a, a good player. I like him. I would like to keep him. But I think somebody around the league would be willing to give Najee six to eight to ten million dollars a year. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we can match that, to be honest with you. And where else are they going to look to finesse things to try to get the contract under control? Will they go the route of the Pelicans and maybe re-sign somebody to get that number down? Yeah, it, those, nice. those are some of the things that uh, that we definitely got to figure out, man, as we move into the season. And, and <clears throat> pardon me why I was kind of looking. I was doing a little research to pull up his uh, contract information. Najee Marshall, you can see, yeah, just under two million DC, one point nine three, and he's gonna command more than that. And then you got a uh, who's who's that two million five right there? That's whole, that's probably uh, Herman Will Gomez. Herman Gomez. He's gone. He's gone. You know, so so that's that's four million dollars there, right? Um, how far are we over the tax? Uh, let's see. Currently, right now, according, let me see the active cap one fifty seven. Point three cap hold at five, uh, fifty point two. The total cap two hundred seven point six. Cap max minus seventy three mil. So cap max space and practical practical cap space is seventeen million. So this is the numbers according to Sport Track here. But you know, let's let let's look at. And it then we, well, I mean, we do have the bird right situation, right? So you when you, I think certain ways when you bring guys back and add them to the cap based on that, it can actually help benefit your cap in a positive way um, due to some of the rules that they implemented for teams such as ourselves to be able to keep our players. But bearing we're not able to do any finagling, man, um, what would you say, Big Q, we, we would have to trade JV? I think it's an option because, I mean, from a financial standpoint, you know, depending on what, how they're looking at this thing, DC, that's something that we got to look at. But uh, it's also the factor of a style fit. It's a fit situation. How they like to switch everything. We know at times uh, when Big V's out there, he could be a detriment uh, in terms of that philosophy. So if the Pelicans, and I know they like Valachunas, they're going to play it from that side of it. Like, man, a lot of people like, man, Q, we need to, you know, move Big V because he is, he can't. How did, how did Big V become the fall guy, though, man? I, he wasn't the end all be all to everything we had going wrong. I always thought that was really weird. I mean, it, it's. It's noticeable though. That's the whole thing. It's like a lot of people see from a stylistic standpoint. The question is, does Valachunas fit what the Pelicans are doing? If they have a switch all mentality, and then in, in some of these games, DC, when you had an athletic big that was on the flow, you know Valachunas struggled to keep up with it, and uh, he doesn't quite switch as well as you would want him to switch. But my 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 uh, complaint was just- I don't know. I don't know how he became a fall guy. My my complaint would be this though, Big Q. Um, throughout the whole season and everything that we did, we wound up with the sixth defense. That's right. Okay, That's now right. where were we ranked offensively? Exactly. Twenty exactly. second yeah. offensively. Was it twenty second? It's twenty second, man, or maybe twenty first. Yeah, yeah, I had not moved on to 2020, 2024, so uh, possibly I could be wrong. But why when we talk about these losses and we think about we never talk about offensively because I thought this year um, a lot of games we lost were based on our inability to to be able to connect the dots at the end of games and and when we went through those dry spells offensively, man, we just had poor execution offensively. You know, almost to the point where it looked like we wouldn't even run plays sometimes when we should run plays. Like, it was always something going on in that aspect. You know what I'm saying? So, we focus on, I guess, switching and JV being bad on defense. I just thought that they never used him properly. That's that's really what I thought. I thought they never used JV properly, man, uh, and maximized everything that he could do. We, 
used them a lot different this year than we did last year. You said points per game, right? Okay, at uh, one, what is it, one fourteen? Or you could say total total offense, just period. One fourteen, uh, four according to uh, team rankings right here, which is good for uh, where is it here? One fourteen four, which is good for thirteenth in terms of scoring year in is that the right years yeah 2022 23 114 a game correct Mm -hmm. so that's uh according to the ranking have them at 13 in the nba so middle of the pack what was the total offense though uh let's see i think that is total like how you do total defense that's scoring right i think it's all scoring yeah it says nba points per game there you go yeah but Offensive ranking. I think like that's how you would do a defensive ranking. That I don't know if that's taking it. into account more than just points per game. Hold on here. Let me see. All right, hold on here because I'm looking yeah, at they're counting efficiency, uh, assist. It's just straight up points per game. That's well, point, if we just going up points per game, I'm obviously way off. Right. Well, yeah, one fourteen point four is just what it is as the key offensive stats. One fourteen point four game. That's middle of the pack. Right. right. Points in the paint, 50, uh, and it breaks down 53.3 uh, points in the paint. They give you the assists per game, which is just about 26 assists per game. Um, then they talk about the turnover ratio or the percentage is 13% per game. Uh, the average score margin is plus 1.8. Fast break points a game is just under 15 points per contest. And you look at the opposing points in terms of the defense. Uh, they give you 112.6. So 114.4 versus 112.6, uh, according to what I'm seeing here from team rankings here. This is the source right here, just to put it on screen for the fam. But go ahead on. In- anyway, DC, go ahead with your point, man. Well, nevertheless, our defense has been better than our offense, in my opinion. And I think a lot of what we need to do to get better is offensively. And I don't think JV impacts that. But as I've current constantly stated, uh, I think JV should be somebody we look to use with the second unit, man, to let him kind of uh, run his thing through the second unit. And we looked at uh, putting somebody else in as a big with that starting lineup, uh, maybe more defensive capable where you could switch everything. But uh, I think going to a defense where you didn't possibly have to switch every single thing with the second unit, um, if you got JV playing that uh that sag off, you know, like uh in the in the box role, will probably benefit better with the second unit than the first unit. Then you got yeah. a guy like uh EJ Liddell, who I'm extremely high on, man. Uh we missed out on all his ability last year and what we could have got out of him, who Larry Nance said out of his own mouth, they asked him what he thinks about EJ Liddell. He said, I think he's somebody that's gonna potentially take my job. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah, he did. So um how would that combination work of uh Larry Nance and EJ Liddell? Or is we looking at are we looking at EJ as a small ball five or uh a four? You know, uh, you got That's Jackson good. Hayes leaving, possibly, um, looking more likely than possible. You got Willie Herman Gomez, who we all know is out of here, you know. Um Mm-hmm. We'll we be able to bring Najee back. Uh, Garrett Temple is on the hook. That's $5 million right there. Um, I think his contract is non-guaranteed. You got Josh Richardson. That's also $10 million, right? Um, we definitely not signing him back at that. Um, is he even added into it? Nah, he's not even on the book. So we still 17 without him even including him. But you start off with the five. With Garrett, you got uh potentially what the two with uh with Najee, you got a uh, oh that's a cap hole. We got a cap hole with uh on Hayes. Signed qualifying offer of Hayes of uh seven point seven seven point seven. That's worth bringing him back at that restricted if it, bird. If it won't uh game. it won't mess up our books. Like why not? And Josh Richardson's uh, cap figure, 18.2, like you said, and he still got some stuff on him. And we now. got a bird right. We got a bird right on him, too. That's right. Josh Richardson might be back. Could be. Why, why are we looking at Tony Snell and all these other people? These are people that's still, that's still attached to, they still got cap figures on the book, cap holes on these guys. But yeah, just with uh, Garrett Temple, 
That's five. And Willie Herman Gomez and Najee, that'll put you at almost like $9 million. And then I guess you got a potentially a restructure in there somewhere, if we could do that. Probably get them under the cap, but you still got to find a way to pay your draft picks, too. Well, you, currently right now, it's the fourth overall uh, pick. In well, the pay draft. your draft pick. I'm yeah, sorry. And the cap figure on that, they anticipating it at uh, round one, pick 14, to be 14.2 mil. So that's what they uh, are looking at. But there's other options, though, DC, when we talk about uh, how to add to the team. You know, we talk about, um, you know, you look at the luxury tax, uh, the, the the threshold right here at 162 point, 162 mil. And uh, the taxable salaries are 157.3 here for a plus 4.6 plus mil. So. You look at the other exceptions that we have and two, you know, we have a couple of exceptions that the Pelicans could use as well. You got the nine taxpayer mid-level exception, and then you have the biannual. Now, the nine taxpayer mid-level one originally was 12.2. That's what it is. Available at 12.2 mil and the biannual at 4.4 plus mil. So they do have a few moves to make and they got some stuff to think about. But, you know, in terms of like, um, Valachunas, who, you know, a lot of people's like, yeah, I, I can get what they're saying on Valachunas. He was four, average 14 and 10 on the season. Mm-hmm. Played a lot of games for the Pelicans. And yes, he's not as athletic as you would like him to be. But uh, for the most part, Valachunas was solid, man. You know, he was very solid. Now, he got in a lot of foul troubles last year because the referees would kind of, you know, kind of hit him with the whistle, DC, when he goes to make those. Uh, when he goes to kind of block up for them guys, man, and they're running around. Yeah, he hit the it, yeah, he hit that wall there, known as Valach as they go down, and he that's he got in trouble with a lot of that. So I don't know how you would as a <laughs> player deal with that or fix that. I, I don't know what you would do uh to address that. But the, the Pelicans definitely have something to think about in terms of how they want to structure the team and if Valachunas fits what the team is doing now and into the future. Now I hear what you're saying about bringing them off the bench and doing things like that. And if you bring them off the bench, I think you alluded to the point that, you know, perhaps you have a smaller player that's playing in that position in the five, perhaps Larry Nance, you mentioned EJ Lydell. Uh, you considered bringing Jackson Hayes back for 7.7 mil. Uh, you know, would that be an answer or perhaps would, you know, what would that look like going forward? Or perhaps, you know, it, it's a multitude of different things we have to consider. Cause a lot of people are going to say, just simply trade Valachunas and go f- and look at another option that fits in the switch, the switch, everything philosophy, a guy athletic big that can switch and move and do what he needs to do. So I get it, man. I get it. I don't know if I'm gonna call Valachunas the fall guy here. I think it's still people are kind of looking at Zion and pointing at Zion because it's hard to be mad at a person that's out there performing versus one that's not, right? At least Valachunas is on the floor, some would say. But Zion Williamson is another whole story here, DC, that we've been talking about. We had the uh, little snippet from Charles Barkley. He was talking about with Zion Williamson's uh, his health and him getting into better shape. We also talked about uh, Carl Malone uh, at some point. Was that last year, the year before last when Carl Malone was inviting him to go up there to North Louisiana to work out with him, just him. He didn't want you mm-hmm. to be an entourage. So at, at what point does this change where we see him and we hear Zion is working out and he's working out and he's working out. It was kind of weird how the season ended with Zion Williamson and the call is like, yeah, I'm just not in basketball shape and all this kind of stuff after telling us and saying over time that he's coming, he's coming in. And I think that's the thing that's really pissing people off about the handling of it so let's speak on that yeah uh i think the handling of it is really crazy because you have these rookies man um who come in they got to figure everything out this this and that and put it together figure out how to eat i mean they are grown men so it's like they're not fully gonna monitor or control everything they do but to me it's like as an organization if you have an asset like Zion Williamson, and we hear the stories about LeBron spending $2.3 million on his body and all of this, right? It always boggled my mind, like, why an organization wouldn't take it upon themselves to do those such things. Like, hey, Zion, uh, 
you, you got the, the hyperbolic time chamber, we call it, when you, you know, they sleep in the oxygen tank. Put, install one of those in his house. You pay for it, right? Like, go above and beyond and help this dude get it together. Because there's so many things I'm sure he doesn't know. Or is it a situation where the Pels have all of these resources and these different things that is at his disposal and he just refuses to do those things, right? And I think that we would never know. But wherever the problem is, it needs to be resolved, whether it's Zion uh, being more serious and dedicated or it's the organization actually uh, being more smarter about how they do things and giving more maybe un what's the word i'm looking for unordinary resources like maybe something that goes above and beyond to to the actual players especially of the caliber of like a zion and a bi you know guys that are typically on the hook for make making you the majority of money you're trying to make you know those guys perform to their best your your franchise excels leaps and bounds so it's a great investment especially if it only costs you an extra two or three million dollars per player like that that's i would think that was a good investment if it could potentially make you hundreds of uh billions of more dollars right doesn't that make sense so the thing with that is is figuring out which issue it is uh like we can all speculate and guess i would say it's the latter and put some of it, um, the majority of it on the organization, but obviously Zion is at fault. I'm not giving him uh, the ability to duck any accountability because he's obviously doing things that he should. But I also look at the organization and you hear a guy like Stan Van Gundy come out and say, hey, we, I had the most successful tenure with Zion and Brandon Ingram with those guys playing. And when you look back on it and when they fired Stan Gundy, they, you know, B.I. hated him. We don't really know how Zion felt. He didn't really speculate. People would speculate and say he didn't like him, but he never really said anything, you know, negative towards uh, Stan Van Gundy. But Stan Van Gundy did say the reason that they were they played the most games and they had the most success, in that opinion, with those guys being on the court, because he allowed them to play. They had hard practices. He made them practice. Uh, some guys maybe didn't like that. But guess what? It resulted in them playing. Uh, Zion played, what, 60-something games? And B.I. played like 67? Zion is a guy that needs to play himself in the shape. Words of his former coach. As well as, uh, what, what's the guy's name that's on NBA TV, Q? Uh, damn, what's that brother's name? He said he coached Zion as, as a younger player. And uh, he said a similar thing. Was the coach from NBA. Coach from AAU, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah, I forgot the man. He said a similar thing about Zion loves ball. They need to let, he needs, he's a guy that needs to play basketball 24-7 all year round. You know, um, Krzyzewski, where is Krzyzewski at, man? Can we influence him to maybe come on board as a a personal assistant, as an advisor? Shit, put a, put a telephone in his hand, too, just like you did, uh, What's your boy name for the son for the sons? He's sitting he's sitting at home sipping my tie somewhere and shit in Miami probably. Yeah. With a Pelicans telephone. Can't remember his name right now, man. I, I'm a little fuzzy. I just switched over to Sank season, been, been looking at everything that excited about them, man. I'm forgetting forgetting people's names and our organizations that we never see. But anyway, y'all know I'm talking about former Phoenix coach, uh Rockets uh coach, Mr. James Harden himself. Can't remember his name right now. But for whatever reason, why why aren't we going that far, man? Dave Shashevsky, I think, would be an excellent addition if we could get him to join. Maybe he just don't want to do anything. Maybe the Pels did try to offer him. You got Trajan Langdon, he's a former Dookie. You got Zion, who's a Dookie. You got B.I., who's a Dookie. I'm sure they like him. I'm sure he can attest to maybe some things that need to be done differently with these guys that maybe work for them. But it's obvious, man, as we've been screaming for two and a half years, we have to do something different as a franchise. Um, we have a lot of solid, I think, pieces and a solid foundation. But we, we got to tweak a lot of things around that. I think uh, how we view our injury assessment and um, 
evaluation and and basically rehabbing and how we do all of that, man, we might need to reset and 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 hit the drawing board again. Um, hit the the great Pelicans think tank and and start coming up with some different ideas, man, and formulating some different ways to go about it. Because we've been trying to do the same thing for about four years, man, and we've been getting the same results. We've had injury riddle seasons every year. Even when you go back to when we first got Lonzo Ball and Drew Holiday, and it's always been the same thing. Everybody deals with injuries, but minus that Stan Van Gundy year, which was the only positive year we had with injuries, and they had really hard practices, and I think guys were actually allowed a little more leeway in playing through some injuries. Or maybe Stan helped him cover it up. I don't know how it went. Maybe that's why he got fired. You might not have been reporting all the shit, telling them not to say nothing. Who knows? But they were on the court, you know, at least till the end of the season, the last 10 games when David Griffin pulled the plug so we can get a better draft pick. And we basically just filed out of the season, even though we could have made the playoffs, right, Q? Yeah. Um, Remember, that was mad about that. Yes, that was horrible. Uh. But the Pels, man, as an organization, need to take full responsibility for what's going on with Zion, even if they feel like a lot of this has been on him. But it's uh, not even holding him accountable and also not pushing him with some of these injuries, man, uh, be able to play through. The foot injury, I kind of understood last year, you know, of them going the extra cautious route. When you read about that injury, uh, Kevin Durant had it. They did the same thing for him, held him out a long time. You know, just it's something that could reoccur. And if it didn't heal properly, it could plague him the rest of his career. Fine. Hamstring injury? Man, I, I don't know, man. Um, I think at some point, Zion probably could have played, and I think we just botched that up. Or maybe I'm wrong about that. But it's a lot that goes on. We don't know with the players in the front office. But the one common thing is that we are mishandling this as a front office, not doing everything that we should do correctly when it comes to these players' injuries. There's no reason Brandon Ingram should have missed 26 games with that toe. Is there something we could have done, maybe going above and beyond, have helped him be able to come back sooner? Because we look at the Zion injury because it pretty much ended the same way last year did. But the Brandon Ingram was a big one, too. Like, if we would have got Brandon Ingram back potentially six or seven games earlier than 25 or, let's say, 10 games, would the Pelicans not still be playing right now? Who knows? Because Zion was pretty close to coming back. Sam Mitchell is who we're thinking about, D.C. There you go. About the AAU coach is Sam Mitchell, man, uh, from Raptors. But, yeah, this is um, everything. The future is tied to Zion Williamson in his injury situation. And you're right. It's a, it's a 50-50 split on my book. You know, in terms of Zion Williams, he's a professional athlete. He paid like a professional athlete. He needs to train like one. He needs to get himself in optimal shape the best way he can. We hear him working out and doing all this other stuff. And that's why people are up upset and people got the right to be upset because they're not getting the value with they, you know, you spend a first round draft pick on the kid. He's in what is in his fifth year coming around into his fifth year now. And we even not, and he missed more games than he played at Duke. So, I mean, this is like, this is terrible. And, and at some point, it's, it's hamstring in the team. It's stunning the development of the team. Now, you got guys that are underneath that's developing, that's getting the reps because the stars aren't out there. But, you know, if you're looking to have a deep run here, you got to solve the Zion Williamson thing. You got you, you, you to gotta solve that. Now, if that's a hiccup in the, in the uh, medical staff, that has to be taken care of. There has to be a philosophy switch here because you have to take – it's been four years of – kid gloving to a degree Zion Williamson it's time to let him play man it's it's put up a shut up time now and the Pelicans have climbed up they you know made the the, the plan uh, the, the year before they were able to get into the playoffs and, and, and kind of run at the Suns last year they got beat in the plan by the OKC Thunder and along the way they were losing to the teams that weren't even playoff teams Mm. You can blame injuries all you want, but I'm saying at some point when you see players are not there, aren't you as an organization supposed to do something, not just sit on your ass and watch the team fall through the floor? Aren't mm. you supposed to bring people up to the G League, have consultation with the coach and tell them, hey, coach, maybe you should open up the rest of your damn bench and start playing some of these young guys and see what they can do. Maybe we need to 
do a better job of cultivating talent on the squadron because we only had two guys that we actually was pulling from the squadron last year that was worth the damn. And we didn't let them touch the court that much. You got a former first round draft pick and KLJ sitting up there who's the fastest player on your team, but he doesn't even sniff the floor consistently. KLJ also shot 40% from the three, man. And they kept, I'm like, why doesn't he, why isn't he getting more minutes? We obviously need know, more three-point shoot. They'll tell you that, and, and as a <laughs> man, double advocate, they'll tell you, well, he don't know the playbook. Well, how the hell he's supposed to learn it if you don't put give him the reps on the, on the live reps that he need? I mean, it's not a perfect. He's supposed statement. to learn it in limited practices, Q. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So at some point, they're going to have to figure this out, man. Willie, Willie has to become a better coach, and I like Coach Willie. But Coach Willie has to be, he has to become a lot more thorough and, uh, you know, more uh, more thorough and more complete coach in so far as looking at his bench and determining what ways he can get these guys in positions to win. You just can't let these, the guys bottom out and put all this pressure on three to four guys off the bench and then the bench is not scoring, D.C. The bench is not scoring. So the pressure's on the top five to make it work. When you got guys missing that's injured, it takes a complete team effort to kind of even – to deal with some of your top aces missing. You got Zion Williamson, who averages 26 points a game. You got to figure a way to reproduce that. You got Brandon Ingram that's in the 20s. So if Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson are missing time, you're going to have to dig into the bench as a collective and have these guys playing together to kind of keep the team going until your stars get back. We didn't see that enough last year. We seen very curious rotations, too much over usage of players to the point where they were wearing them down. You know, Paul Larry was banged up all of the majority of the year last year. He was trying, but he just wasn't Larry Nance. Can't wait for him to get 100 percent come back. You know, so we talk about EJ Liddell, but think about it. EJ Liddell is a second round draft pick player. Will Willie really give him the floor? He ain't give Jay- yeah, yeah, I, I, th- I think you I will know. before you continue to go on. I mean, I have you have you watched seriously watch EJ Liddell? I'm not talking about EJ Liddell watching him. I know he can play, but I'm talking about Willie. I know that KLJ. Well, he does everything that Willie loves, in my opinion, man. Uh, EJ Liddell, to me, one of his greatest attributes for this team, even though he's a hell of a scorer, too, will be his defense, man. That, that dude is a menace defensively, bro. So, in my opinion, if you can do what you do defensively and all, on offense, which I think he won't, you know, basically have the the Dyson Daniels thing. We got the... uh. Well, what's going on here? <laughs> well, if you got if you don't have a Dyson Daniels thing, man, where he messes up offensively, um, kind of drops the ball there. Will Willie's gonna play him, man? EJ could be the new Herb Jones, as far as Willie Green is concerned. <laughs> All I, can I, I got a lot of I got a lot of. Uh, I guess I say I hate to say the word Q. Cause you know I ran low on supply. I stopped selling that stuff. You know um, I got a lot of hope in EJ Liddell. But... Nah, EJ Liddell <laughs> is a player, man. We know that. You know I watched plenty of film on EJ Liddell. It's phenomenal, bro. But 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 in terms of we know he could play. But I'm talking about in terms of Willie. That's about. Wait, that, did, did that come off uh off of Kyra's iPod? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's what that's what I'm on, bro. I'm on that. That's what he got to do. They Willie really got to show me, man. He got to trust more in his young guys. And I know that Herb got on the floor because of his defense, but you know, and but that's one of Herb's. That's that's a strong attribute. We know EJ Liddell can, will be able to. I mean, do- look at Larry Q. Larry then, then basically then did he, he did he have more minutes than JV per game last year? Yeah, he fits what he wants to do more, though, DC. That's the thing. That's the easy So does EJ Liddell. EJ Liddell is basically, like, uh, to me, uh, an offensively better version of Larry Nance. I mean, that's tall words, man. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what I see. Potentially. He's got a better three-point shot, a uh, better mid-range. He's more creative offensively. It's not perfect offensively, obviously. but And he can do... Uh, a lot of those same things defensively that Larry can do. And he's he's, he's got a little more um, athleticism. He's quicker. Pretty damn strong, too. I mean, you see them tree trunks. He, well, we talk about Zion. That dude got uh, some tree trunks he walking around with, too. We'll see, man. 
We'll see. I, I, it's, it's, he has to trust in those. But young. he ain't played an NBA minute yet, bro. That's so what I'm saying. All of this, and he ain't set foot. He got a lot on of potential. Actual NBA, real live game court yet. But we, I guess, we are gonna see in the summer league. I, I would think he would get some burn. There you go. We start with the so summer. If we see that Trey Murphy jump like we saw from one summer league to the next. That that'd be a pretty good sign. To uh, he's Larry, not six six anymore Nancy. either. I don't think. I think he's the same. He says they say he the same height as, as Larry Nance, man. So EJ is potentially about six eight now. Six eight two four. That's pretty solid, DC. So yeah. So there we go. So yeah, he'll be a big part of what the Pelicans do. But you know, like we got a lot of questions, man. Do the Pelicans keep on hold of Valachunas or whatnot? I, I don't know if we can expect a lot of movement going on with the flock this year. I think a lot of them might just stand pack in terms of uh, and say, we'll keep this and try to see if we can kind of adjust this in there. Uh, 